Well, good morning, everyone. <laughs> it's nice to start the day with a laugh, isn't it? <laughs> well, welcome to St. Mark's on this third Sunday of the Easter season, and welcome, too, to those who are joining us online. It is good to be together to worship no matter how we gather together. Here at St. Mark's, we do gather on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous peoples from the beginning. We acknowledge the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, including the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. This territory is covered by the Williams Treaty of 1923 and the Jay Collins Land Purchase of 1785. We acknowledge the harm caused by colonization, and we commit to learn, to listen, and to work towards genuine truth and reconciliation. Now, I... Uh, have a few announcements about this week coming up. On Tuesday morning, there is Knit One, Pray Two. And in the evening, there is Board of Managers. On Wednesday morning, the men will gather for breakfast at Friends Restaurant at what time, Ross? Eight, nine, nine at 9 o'clock. And not to be outdone, the women who did not meet last week are going to have breakfast at the Curling Club at 8.30. <laughs> So make note of that on your calendars. The women's breakfast will happen this week. And on Thursday, there is a uh, choir practice uh, at 9.30, all these different times. Um, I will be away at a conference for interim moderators this week. Um, but if you have a pastoral emergency, please contact Irene, and she will be able to get in touch with me uh, if that is necessary. Next Sunday, on April the 21st, uh, we are having worship in the morning as usual, and of course it will be wonderful, but in the afternoon we are going to have uh, an, an afternoon of great music here at St. Mark's. The Hawkstone Singers, under the leadership of Terry, will be here, and also the Bearded Baritones from Kitchener-Waterloo. Some of you know that uh, one of my son-in-laws, Jake, is, is a founding member of the Bearded Baritones, and uh, they're a great uh, group of young men who are always willing to come and sing for us, and we are grateful for that. So at 2 o'clock next Sunday afternoon, there will be an a open church, a free will offering. So tell your friends, tell your family, and come and enjoy some wonderful music. Looking ahead um, to May the 5th, which is also a Sunday, the first Sunday in May, uh, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Canada, uh, Reverend Mary Fontaine is coming to Aurelia. On Saturday afternoon, there will be a healing circle held at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church. We're going to um, focus, or we're all going to meet at St. Andrew's that day because they just have a lot more room than we do. Mary uh, Fontaine is Indigenous, and she uh, grew up in Mistawasis, which is in the, on the prairies, but she now leads a ministry in Vancouver called Hummingbird Ministries. And she's been very involved in the healing and reconciliation work of our church. So there will be a um, healing circle on Saturday afternoon at 1 p.m. at St. Andrews. And then together on that Sunday, on May the 5th, we will worship all together at St. Andrews, but Mary will be preaching and leading worship that day. It will be a communion service that morning too uh, that Mary will lead. So Mary is a friend of mine. She's a wonderful woman, and I think you will really enjoy meeting her. She is delightful, um, and I'm, I'm hoping that you will take the time to attend those events if possible and meet Mary and offer to her the St. Mark's hospitality that we are so well known for. Now, I did forget to look at our special days in the congregation this week, so let me do that right now. Well, it looks like today is Jim and June Nichols' wedding anniversary. Happy anniversary! On Friday, it is Mia's birthday. How old is she going to be? She's going to be 14. Unbelievable. And on Saturday, it's John Freely's birthday, Alexander Sandris's birthday, and George Rumpel's birthday. So let's sing to them all.
Irene, am I forgetting anything? No, it's so nice to have Irene there to tell me, you're okay. <laughs> Let's take a moment now just to quiet our hearts and our minds as we prepare to worship God together. I would invite you now to join with me in the call to worship, which is found on our screens. Peace be with you. And also with you. Come and see the love God has given to us. Come and see what it means to be children of God. Come with this hope that Christ's presence is real. With joy we come to see the Lord. As we begin to worship, please join in our introit, which is He is Lord, and that is found in our book of praise, number 252. If you're able, I would invite you to stand. I'd invite you to turn your hearts to God in prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, the light of your love shines on, illuminating the places where you are present. As the bewildered disciples pondered the stories of your appearances, you penetrated the darkness of their fear and doubt with your word of peace. You showed them the appalling marks of evil pierced on your hands and feet. You opened their minds to understand why you had to die to defeat such evil and death. Increase our understanding, we pray, and open our minds and hearts to receive you, Lord. Speak your word of peace to us, and let your love shine on any dark areas in our lives. May this worship which we offer in your name be a worthy response to your love and your sacrifice for us. You call us, God, to acknowledge and confess our sins to you, and so that is what we will do. God, you have told us to trust in you with all of our hearts. You have told us not to lean on our own understanding. And so we try to trust but we get very nervous when we don't understand. And we don't understand by what you mean by this bread is my body, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. We don't understand who will betray you or why or what that will mean for us. We don't understand how death can be victory. We don't understand post-resurrection life, yours or ours. We don't understand why you ask us to stay, and we're afraid that we will somehow miss the power when it comes down from on high. Forgive us, O oh God. May our lives reflect your great love for us, even when we fail to live up to your hopes for us. We pray this in the name of the risen Savior, Jesus, 
And now we offer the prayer he taught his disciples to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Friends, know and believe this. Jesus is gentle with our doubts. The Spirit offers us peace in the midst of our lack of understanding. The one who created us promises to lead us step by step into deeper trust and relationship. May you live in peace with yourself and others and God, knowing your sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God for this wonderful gift. Amen. And now, as we have received peace with God through Christ, I would invite you to pass that same peace of Christ to those who worship with you. The peace of Christ be with you all. Peace be with you. Our hymn is God, We Praise You for the Morning, which is in the Book of Praise at number 436. Um, this morning, many of you may have awoken to the same news that I did, that Iran had launched missiles at Israel. And my heart just sank. And I thought to myself, when is this going to end? And something that Mahatma Gandhi said uh, came to my mind, and that is, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind, right? 
and I thought to myself, how am I going to talk to the kids about this in our children's time? But God, <laughs> thank God there were no children here because it's a difficult thing, and I, I don't really mean that. Um, it's a difficult thing to talk to children about what is happening in our world today. But I think even children know the truth of an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind because it reminds me of what can happen on the playground at school. You know, he poked me first, so I punched him back, and then I, you know, got one to the head, and it just keeps escalating. Children see that happening all the time. And I wonder when, as grown-ups, we're going to recognize the truth of an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. In our scripture today, uh, Jesus is making his post-resurrection appearances to the disciples, and he is telling them what it means to them to live as witnesses of the resurrected Christ. And I think if we as grown-ups can live as witnesses to the resurrected Christ in our own lives, it will go a long way to healing this world. So, if someone pokes you, don't poke them back. And I'm talking about not physical poking, of course, but, you know, people do this all the time on social media. Don't respond. Don't react. Don't escalate things. In your personal relationship, if someone does something that angers you, don't respond. Don't react. Don't retaliate. We have to start in our own lives if the world is going to change. So... That's my little rant for today. <laughs> but just remember, an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind, and we really don't want to be walking about in the dark. Amen. Our hymn is Jesus is Risen from the Grave, number 254 in the Book of Praise. Before we <coughs> hear scripture, let's ask God to bless uh, our reading of God's word. Let us pray. God of word and wisdom, the risen Christ opened the minds of his friends to understand the scriptures. Send us your Holy Spirit to open our minds, to receive your truth and love which can fill our hearts and change our lives. Amen.
you. That was beautiful. I'm going to invite you now to join in reading Psalm 4 responsively, and that will come up on our screen. I will read the first verse, and you will read the, the even number verses. Answer me when I call to you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. And our reading from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be, has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. And our gospel reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 36b to 48. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they had seen a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, because of joy and amazement, he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And he said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. In the name of God the Father, our Creator, God the Son, our Redeemer, and God the Spirit, our Sustainer. Amen. Well, we had been hearing about it for quite some time. It had been predicted for years. Experts had written about it. Certain cities prepared for overwhelming crowds, and some even invoked emergency planning. There was hype. There was excitement. 
Was this really going to be a once in a generation event? Of course, I'm talking about the solar eclipse that happened on Monday. Now, I had not planned to do anything special around the solar eclipse, but my daughter Martha bought me a pair of those glasses, ever so attractive glasses. And Kate and her family had found a great place to watch it. And in the end, the whole family converged at Dunville on the RCAF museum grounds. It was actually a perfect place to see the eclipse. And while there were a few hundred other people there as well, we didn't feel crowded. And the clouds parted at just the right time so we could see the totality of the eclipse when it happened. And as much as it was a wonderful experience and I knew what was to come, I couldn't help but feel just a little bit spooked as the moon moved to totally block the sun. As darkness descended in the middle of the day, I couldn't help but think of a day just over 2,000 years ago when in the middle of another day, darkness covered the earth. It was a Friday, and scripture tells us that the darkness stayed that day for three hours until Jesus offered those unforgettable words, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Now those of us watching the eclipse knew, or should have known, what to expect. The experts had told us in great detail when the totality would occur and how long the darkness would last. And yet, when it became dark and quite cold, there was also a feeling of uncertainty that settled on the crowd. The sound of the birds that we had heard before stopped. And we were all, behind our interesting looking glasses, feeling just a bit disoriented, I think. Would the light, in fact, return? Would the warmth return? Would the world return to normal? As I thought about these feelings, I wondered if those might have been some of the same feelings that Jesus' disciples experienced on the day of his death. Shock and grief can certainly be disorienting. Add some fear, and it's not much wonder they didn't know what was real and what wasn't. Not much wonder that they didn't recognize Jesus when he appeared to them at different times and different places after the resurrection. Now, it's not that he hadn't told them what was going to happen to him. He had told them, hadn't he? In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus makes reference to his suffering and death half a dozen times before he gets to Jerusalem. And then he takes his disciples aside and he says, See, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles. He will be mocked and insulted and spat upon. After they have flogged him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Could he have been any more direct? And yet, Luke says, they understood nothing about these things. In fact, what he said was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what he said. And so, once again, in that upper room, he explained to his disciples, you see, he said, it is written, the Messiah is to suffer and rise on, from the dead on that third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be preached in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. In other words, beginning right where you are. And you are witnesses of these things. Carol Howard Merritt has written about her father's death 
and how that experience helped her to understand how the disciples might have been feeling as darkness descended and in the days to follow. And I want to share with you some of what she's written. I cannot help but understand how disorienting grief can be. Mary sees Jesus in the garden and she thinks that he is the gardener. She doesn't recognize him. Close friends cannot believe the stories they're whispering to each other as they hide in locked rooms. They cannot quite trust the women who saw the empty tomb and they demand proof. On the road to Emmaus, followers of Jesus walk right beside him until the sun sets in the horizon. They feel the warming in their hearts, and yet they still do not recognize him. They think he's a stranger. How did they not know it was him? Was there something different about his body? He is, after all, appearing in such strange places. He shows up outside of his own grave, in locked rooms, on the beach, on the road, on the hillside. Sometimes he vanishes. And then there's that moment of recognition, that moment that looks so different in each case. For Mary, it was hearing her name on Jesus' lips. When she heard it, she recognized him. For Thomas, the man who demanded that he would need some tactile proof, Jesus showed off his scars to him. He invited Thomas to touch his gaping wounds. But there's no mention of Thomas actually touching the torn flesh. It seems that seeing was enough for him. For some of the disciples, the recognition came when the stranger on the beach told them to put their nets on the other side of the boat. And when they did, their nets were pulled in, overflowing with fish. And for the disciples on the way to Emmaus, they recognized him when he broke the bread. In all of these stories, there's such confusion and disorientation and bewilderment. And I wonder, why did they keep that bit in the story? Why didn't the authors edit it out? She writes, if I were Mary, I probably would have told people, well, I knew who it was all along. And she goes on to say, I never understood this until I went through the disorienting grief. Now it seems that these Easter moments were somehow more than recognition. It was not that they merely identified the color of his skin, the cut of his hair, or the shape of his eyes. It was revelation. In each case, they were confronted with the realization that the stranger standing in front of them was somehow divine. In the sorrow, confusion, doubt, and grief, Jesus was revealed. These events tell us something important about the nature of revelation. Revelation means a revealing. That seems kind of obvious when you think about it. And since revelation is ongoing, mean, meaning it happens little by little, there is always something of God that remains hidden. We never know God fully. We're always waking up to new mysteries of God. All of this meant something else to me in my own disorienting grief because it reminded me that just like the disciples, when we are in the depth of our sorrows, we may not even recognize that Jesus is standing right beside us, whispering in our ear, warming our hearts, trying to make sense of the confusion that surrounds us. We may not see God at all in those moments. Because the very fact that God is sometimes revealed in our lives hinges on the reality that God is also often hidden. 
Unless God is hidden, God cannot be revealed. Unless God is hidden, God cannot be revealed. And yet in our confusing grief, in our sorrows, loss, anxieties, depressions, addictions, recoveries, worries, and concerns, in each place that we find ourselves, we know that if we keep walking, if we keep gathering at table, if we keep listening for God, if we keep putting one foot in front of the other, if we keep treating the strangers among us as messengers from God, if we stay open to those moments when we feel strangely warmed, just like those disciples on the road to Emmaus, then God just might reveal God's self to us. Now, I know that it has been a very difficult time for so many in our church family over the last few months. The fallout from illness and death and family issues and any number of other situations that come to mind, that fallout continues and plays havoc with our hearts and our minds. We might find ourselves reacting out of fear and grief. And that leads us to wonder where God is in all of this. We might be wondering if the sun will shine brightly again, if the darkness that seems to be enveloping us will lift. Friends, that is why Jesus returned to his disciples. Jesus returned to his disciples in a body that bore the marks of his suffering. Jesus' scars tell a story. They tell the story of a God who is, as Josh Scott writes in the Christian Century, committed to a vision of God and God's kingdom that is just and generous, with an embrace wide enough for anyone and everyone. They tell a story of resisting dehumanizing forces by insisting on a God who sees everyone as valuable a God who has numbered every hair on our heads. Jesus' scars tell a story of refusing violence in favor of peacemaking and returning love in the face of hatred. The truth is the scars by which Jesus' disciples know him encapsulate the very essence of the life he lived that led to them in the first place. Now, many Christians speak of the future hope of living in a resurrected body which will be perfect and free from any of the things that bother us or cause us pain or frustration about our current bodies. And that is a wonderful hope. But I want you to notice that none of the Gospels portray Jesus in that way. None of them portray the resurrected Christ as coming back with a perfect body. No, he returns with his scars very much on display. No doubt they are reminders of the immense suffering and agony he went through. They even could be seen as souvenirs of a failed mission. That's surely what Good Friday must have felt like to so many of them. And yet, the risen Christ embraces those scars, and he uses them to comfort his disciples and confirm his identity and more, his story, his plan for salvation for us. Richard Rohr is a very wise theologian who understands people very well. And he has this to say. He says, if we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. If we do not transform our pain, we will most assuredly transmit it. And I believe in my experience in life that is true. The risen Christ allows his pain to be transformed and as a result, he allows healing and hope to flow from his wounds to his disciples and through them 
well beyond them. Each time the disciples encountered the risen Christ, the light of the world, I imagine their faith and their belief, their determination to live as disciples of Jesus grew, and the light inside of each of them shone just a little brighter. Friends, you may be in a time of darkness now, but little by little, day by day, the light will return. Because the light of the world rose from the darkness of the grave to comfort and reassure and give hope and strength to all of his disciples, those who lived a few centuries ago and to his disciples who walk the earth today. So walk in and with that light and know that it has the power to overcome all of the darkness, not just in your own lives, but in this world. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn is Christ Has Risen While Earth Slumbers, and I would invite you to stand if you're able. I would invite you now to uh, turn your hearts to God once again as we offer the prayers for this world. Let us pray. God of love and grace, in these early days after we have celebrated your resurrection, we do wonder what it all means. We can relate to the women who fled the tomb with terror and amazement. We understand Thomas and his need for proof that would come only by touching the wounds and seeing the nail marks. We understand the fear and confusion that kept the disciples in the shadow cast by closed doors. 
We also keep company with the travelers on the Emmaus Road who felt the strange burning of the truth and hope and love weaving into the sadness that consumed them on their walk. We find ourselves in the eternal movement between fear and faith, doubt and conviction, worry and wonder, and we trust that you are present with us, O God. We trust that like the disciples, we will be able to stand and tell the whole message about this life, that love is stronger than hate. Life has the final word over death. Beyond what we can see with our eyes, there is a bond of humanness that draws and keeps us together. And so, God, we remember this world you love so much. And we offer our prayers for its health and well-being. We remember our brothers and sisters in Taiwan as they recover from devastation wrought by the strong earthquake there last week. We watch with anxiety as the world reverberates with new tensions in the Ukraine, in Russia, in Israel, Gaza, Iran, the whole Middle East, in South Sudan, <coughs> in Afghanistan, where the Taliban is to resume stoning women to death, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Chad, South Africa, Zimbabwe, in Mexico, in Guatemala, in Venezuela, in these places and so many more, people, animals, and the earth are suffering because of war, natural disasters, economic and politi political instability, and injustice. But in the midst of that, there are also voices of reason and peace. Perhaps they speak in whispers, but they speak nonetheless. May those whispers rise to shouts that proclaim the way forward with words and not weapons. As the machines of greed and war trample the world and its peoples, we remember that there are seeds of justice and love and goodness and grace that are planted and watered every moment of every day. And so we give thanks for those who rise early in the morning to prepare food at countless soup kitchens around the world. For those who search the night streets for lost children and shepherd them to places of safety. We thank you for those who keep watch amidst the sick and the dying in countless hospitals and in countless places. We thank you for those who speak words of compassion in the face of hate. It is a complicated and frightening world, O oh God. Strengthen us as we stand and bear witness to this whole life, the life of the risen one, even Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It is helpful to remember that our lives overflow with blessing and goodness in Christ and in creation. Out of the bounty with which God has blessed us, let us now present to God our offering with gratitude that is overflowing. The offering will now be received.
Maker, you have filled the world with so much abundance. We offer our gifts to you knowing they are part of your abundance. Bless them and use them to bring hope and new life in Christ's name to a world that so badly needs these gifts. Amen. Our final hymn today is Now Let the Vault of Heaven Resound, number 255 in the Book of Praise. Life is short, and is, we don't have much time to gladden the hearts of those who walk the way with us. So make haste to love, be swift to be kind, and may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you and those you love this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen.